raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the bottle said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our very favorite corner of the Crosstime Pub, exploring the wonders of the ancient world and especially those which still remain having stood the tests of time. We'll be digging into that particular topic a bit this week as we dig deeper, as we always do. The Seven Ages team, glad to be here tonight. Glad at least somebody else showed up because it looks like we're one man short. But as always, Jason Pentrail is in the house, sir. How you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, the old cross times are a little uh, sparse here tonight. But uh, nonetheless, we made it here. You know, today was the first real day of autumn here in balmy South Carolina. And so uh, that puts me in the mood to read. So I've got a big stack of books right here. I'm all geared up for after I get the kids put to bed tonight. But inevitably, I'll probably only make it 10, maybe 15 minutes into one of these fine books I have here, you know, before my eyes start crossing and uh, it's going to be time for bed. So yeah. you know how that goes. I do. And all those books and keeping with the season, they're all Edgar Allan Poe, aren't they? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that. I actually did go through some Poe here recently. As you know, here in Charleston, he is a bit of a local celebrity. So this time each year, we kind of have a little bit of uh, Poe reading. It's a big thing around the area. So he's always in our mind this time of the year. But no, it's been everything from mound builders to Egypt and everything in between uh, for the reading material this time of year. Yeah, I enjoy the Edgar Allan Poe also. And yes, you caught the reference. He being something of a local favorite there in Charleston, having spent some time out there on, I believe, Sullivan's Island. I think he was stationed out there at Fort Moultrie for a time, wasn't he? Yes, that's correct. He yeah. Was. But you know, as enigmatic and mysterious as Mr. Poe was, the real mystery tonight, the real question is where is James Waldo? He's in home! Who was in his tights? <laughs> as usual. Well, James, we miss you. Wish you were here, pal. But uh, since you're not, we're just going to go on without you. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't have any other choice. So, uh, yeah, sometimes it's hard to, uh, you know, get everybody here to the pub in the middle of the week like this. But uh, nonetheless, we're thinking of you, James, and uh, we'll catch up with you here soon, I'm sure. You know what I love about Guinness, Jason? Well, there's a lot of things, uh, but you go first. Apart from the flavor, even. I mean, if you know, when you pour it and it's got this layered effect it's kind of like it's got its own stratigraphy right it's the archaeology of beers yeah we're well, the beer of archaeology yeah. either way <laughs> <laughs> yeah just depending on how you look at it my favorite part is when you pour it in the glass and then you just sit there and watch it as it settles out to create the head on top and everything's kind of flowing up from the bottom oh Can't yes be. the backward cascade now if That's only it. archaeology would do that for us because then the treasures of the past would move their way to the surface and reveal themselves, and thereby we wouldn't have to conduct excavations and, you know, engage in what is at times rather invasive archaeology. I wonder what Dr. Bob Breyer will have to say about that as we talk about Egypt in this episode, one of our favorite topics. I know I often bring it up a lot because it's no big secret. In fact, it comes up on my other podcast as well from time to time. I'm just fascinated with Egypt. And I did an interview with a gentleman. Actually, he was interviewing me this week. And that was one of the questions. He said, what do you think about how the pyramids were built? Uh, and I said, well, one thing we know for certain is that the Egyptians did it. The only thing that's really mysterious is the exact method. But I got a, a theory I want to run by you here, Jason, that, that struck me recently. I was looking at some of the work of the Scan Pyramids Project. You remember the project I'm talking about, right? Yes, I do. And, you know, the use of cosmic rays to try and possibly determine what certain interior regions of for instance, Khufu's Pyramid, but really this would apply to any of them, any of those structures on the Giza Necropolis. That actually goes back to the 1960s. But the Scan Pyramids Project have probably made the most news in recent years, and they've received some, you know, some statements that are fairly promising from the likes of, uh, you know, Mark Lanner and also even Zahi Hawass and others, who I think had the latter, Zahi, been a bit more resistant initially. But when you look at this 
structure. At this point, you know, all fringe theories and craziness aside, I mean, it's hard to deny that there is some sort of a structure that is essentially the same shape, the same diagonal orientation as the Grand Gallery directly below it, but that we haven't accessed yet. We don't know what could be in there. And there are some promising developments. In, in fact, the Scan Pyramids team even suggest uh, that we may be able to get a feel for whether there are at least objects inside that area. But I'm looking at the sloping appearance. And one of the number one questions that people always come to me and ask, as if I'm some sort of an expert, but again, I'm an avocationalist who reads a lot about Egypt, as well as the Paleo-Indian American archaeology, which is kind of our, you know, our main beat here on Seven Ages. Uh, but people are always asking, you know, how do you think they did it? How could they have built these pyramids? They couldn't have used a ramp. We talked a bit about this on the last episode. The, no the notion that a ramp might have gone up the side of the pyramid more like switchbacks as opposed to a single long sloping ramp, which would have been almost as difficult to construct as the pyramids themselves. So there are a lot of really interesting ideas, but it struck me when I was looking at some of these images that the Scan Pyramids Project have produced with these upward sloping areas. One of them, I mean, clearly known, of course, the Grand Gallery, but then above it, this mysterious void, as they have called it, it seems to have the same shape and the same sort of directional inclination. And I'm looking at that thinking, what if there are portions of the pyramid that are actually interior within the pyramid that were as a part of its construction used as part of the ramp system to help construct the pyramids? In other words, what if some of the mysterious questions about how the pyramids were built we're sort of baked in, and with time we may actually reveal some of those things. Now, my feeling would be that if there had been large sandstone slabs that had been dragged along sloping inclines, there would definitely be evidence of that. And so I would find it hard to believe that Egyptologists had not yet discovered some sort of evidence if indeed such existed within the pyramid. But who knows, maybe at some point if we ever do enter or find a way that we can learn more about the interior of the so-called void, it may at very least give us some additional clues on the structural elements of the pyramid, and that also could help us learn a few things about maybe how the builders actually did it. But I mean, one thing that's no longer in question, the Egyptians built the pyramids that's been known for a long time. You still see references in the media every few years or so to people talking about, you know, slaves building the pyramids and all these alternative theories and things like that. And I'm like, guys, at this point, how are we still having that conversation? you got to hand it to them. Their ingenuity, their technical prowess, it was amazing. And in the intro, Jason, as I'm saying, you know, studying the wonders of the ancient world, something that I often try to point out about the pyramids, of the wonders of the ancient world, as they were known, one of those, one instance of these architectural feats still remains today. And it ain't the Colossus of Rhodes. No, it's the pyramids. And again, what better testament to the ingenuity of the ancient Egyptians than the fact that these monuments, known as a wonder of the world in the, the era in which they were built, and of course, for thousands of years thereafter, but still, of course, classical antiquity when ancient people were marveling over these structures, which were already old at that time. But even today, they remain. I mean, some of the most incredible engineering feats, really, of all time, if not the most incredible. Well, you know, it's it's one of those things that's all encompassing. It it captures every bit of the imagination. And I think that's why, you know, Egypt has always been so popular because it's not just the pyramids, but it's the beauty of the temples, the placement, you know, all of that structure and all of that heritage and culture, old kingdom, new kingdom, uh, into the Greco-Roman time period. There's so much there to explore uh, along the Nile and, you know, the beauty of the area, the mystery of the area. But you know, the technology, the craftsmanship, the artistry was so high there that it, it's, you know, it captures the imagination and it allows you to uh, wonder what else is still there to be discovered. And every time we seem to think that we've got it all figured out, something new comes along. So whether it is, you know, the void in the uh, Great Pyramid there that, you know, it could be something that is just as simple as uh, part of the structure, you know, something that is, is key for the stability of the structure being so large and heavy. We don't know, but I'm certainly looking forward to uh, more research in that area. But then as we get into the wonders of Tutankhamun here and this interview tonight with Dr. Breyer, it's again, you know, it, it's one of those rare instances in history where Egypt has offered up just a glimpse into what it would have been like 
to see one of these undisturbed tombs. And of course, as we all know, the tomb that Tutankhamun was placed in appeared to not be built for him. Uh, it was probably for someone else. And because of his early death, he was rushed into that. So you can imagine what, you know, Seti or Ramses the Great or uh, Amenhotep the Third or any of these really prominent pharaohs, what those burials and tombs must have looked like. But needless to say, that little bit of uh, insight into what we've learned from Tutankhamun has made him a worldwide celebrity. And that's what we're celebrating on this very special episode tonight, the 100th anniversary of the discovery of that enigmatic and classically beautiful tomb of Tutankhamun. Yes, indeed. Again, one of the things that really sets it apart uh, and something that really more broadly has generated so much controversy over the years, the sarcophagi in the pyramids, these structures believed to have been built as tombs of these pharaohs, but of course those sarcophagi were empty. And so people have long, because of the emptiness, tried to argue, well, how do we really know that they were tombs? It seems pretty evident. And I think that there's an abundance of both early historical and also archaeological evidence that supports that fact. Although it's also possible that structural elements in the design of the pyramids and things like this also could have served other functions. But that notwithstanding, with Tutankhamun, what we have is we do have an intact burial, even if it wasn't initially intended to be the location where he would be buried, by the unique set of circumstances uh, through which his burial and the sealing of the chamber and its preservation over time occurred, we have this, I think, to kind of mirror what you're describing, a unique window into the ancient Egyptian world, one that as a result of grave robbery and other things that have occurred at some of these more prominent sites, you know, we don't have that same level of preservation, which has led to all this, you know, controversy and conspiracy, you know, so the Tutankhamun discovery, now hard to believe it was a century ago, but I mean, it we have a measurable wealth that we gain from that, not in terms of the riches that were contained within that tomb, but in terms of the knowledge that it actually gives us in that window that it provides. Yeah, great points all around. And, you know, again, as we get into this tonight, you're going to learn a lot about Tutankhamun that you probably didn't realize. And, you know, one of the points that we discuss with Dr. Breyer is the fact that oftentimes because of his age, uh, Tutankhamun is often looked at as a minor pharaoh. But really, as we get into it tonight, you're going to understand how that's simply not the case. He was the first pharaoh after the heretic pharaoh, Akhenaten. So his father, you know, had created a new capital, a new religious structure. And he was the one, Tutankhamun, that is, is the one that was going to be responsible for restoring the country to the old ways. So to say that he was not important in the scheme of things is a great misnomer. And I think you're going to learn from Dr. Breyer tonight just how important that's that little time period where he existed was and just how it reflects on the history of Egypt. Indeed. And we don't want to waste any time getting into that. But of course, first, I do want to mention that we've got a lot going on over there on the Seven Ages Patreon. Jason, can you fill us in? They're good, buddy. Absolutely. So we're continuing to uh, get new material out there, trying some new things. We just recorded our first episode of our new book club. It went uh, really well. We had our good friend Chris Judge join us. You'll remember him from the Legends of White Pond episode. And we are exploring the uh, classic book from 1700s, the Journal of John Lawson called a new voyage to Carolina. So we've got a great conversation going over there with our patrons. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in, we also have the Dig Deeper podcast. We also have the Cross Time Pub, which is our normal staple podcast over there. So we got a lot of great things going on for you, a lot of brand new content that's exclusive to Patreon. So again, just go there, search for Seven Ages Podcast. It'll pop right up and uh, feel free to join us over there for some extra content throughout the month. Absolutely. You know, I hope over the wintertime, maybe I can carve out a little time to jump on one of those podcasts, maybe one or two with you guys, because uh, for those at home who follow this endeavor, but don't keep up with other things I have going on, I'm the editor in chief right now of a high traffic science, technology and defense website known as the debrief. And that uh, really commands a lot of my time. In addition to all the other things I have going on, still doing music on the weekends and everything like that. But, um, you know, despite the busy schedule, I still love the archaeology and just to further that point, I recently had some friends in town, and I decided to treat them to a day in Sevierville, Tennessee, and what was the very first place I took them? That's right. We dropped by the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. Our buddy Chase was off on an adventure, I was told. 
while we were there. But boy, I was really happy to see copies of your book all over the place over there. And my good friends, John and Amanda, who came all the way over here from California, they were very interested. John bought a copy of your book, sir. And of course, they also picked up some fantastic history for sale right there in the Relic Room. So what's going on over there in the Relic Room, apart from me dropping in and looking for our buddy Chase and helping you sell some books? Well, first of all, I'm glad that he actually bought one and he didn't just pose for the picture. No, he bought so, it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. It's certainly appreciated. Uh, yeah, so Chase is always busy, as you know. Uh, right now is the time of the year where he's catching a little bit of a break and he's spending some time with his son, Isaac, and they're out doing what they do the most on the road, just looking around, not going too far this time, but having a wonderful experience together as they always do. But being said, he's always keeping up with everything at the shop there, right? So he's got brand new stuff coming in, even while he's out there spending time with his family. Brand new assortment of fluorite slices and various types of forms. We got tourmaline coming in, and he just picked up over 100 kilos of grape agate. So if you've never seen grape agate before, it is strikingly beautiful. It's one of the most uh, interesting displays that you could put on a shelf into a curio cabinet, anything like that. I plan on picking some of that up myself. It truly is striking. Then over on the YouTube, you know, the educational side of what they do there at Chasing History, uh, they got new episode on the Civil War history. And then also keep in mind that those Mound Builder series that we've been doing here on the podcast, he, uh, Chase, has also been documenting those through the visual field. So he has four documentaries over there on his YouTube, one for Pinson, Spyro, Poverty Point, and Moundville. All four of those were documented on video as we were there at those sites. So if you want to kind of put the images with the voices, pop over there and check out those four. And then, of course, on the podcast, Chasing History Radio, He's got a very, very interesting topic this time. It's called battlefield pickups. So these are items related to a specific battle that were discarded by the participants of that battle, then later collected by locals and repurposed into some other type of tool or use. And so it's, it's kind of a rare thing, but oftentimes those people who live in and around Civil War battlefields, other type of battlefields, you know, they would find things and they would repurpose them into other things that they would actually use in their daily life. So it's it's a continuation of the history, if you will. And that's one more thing that you can learn over there at Chasing History Radio. So, again, he's always uh, keep staying busy, staying out there on the road, keeping the store freshly stocked with brand new items. Again, our friends over there and sponsor for the show at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room inside of the Smoky Mountain Knife Works, Sevierville, Tennessee, the largest diversity of history for sale in North America. I just got to add one more thing, too, since I was over there recently. And I know he listens to our podcasts when he's out there adventuring all over the place. So, Chase, next time I stop in, I hope you're around. I want to give you a big hug and hang out, maybe have a cup of coffee with you. But John and Amanda and I, we were going around and we were looking at all the wonderful things over there. And, man, I, I tell you, the uh, expanded space, now that they have you know grown and expanded, it's just incredible all the stuff that you'll find in there. Not just history. But of course, those who love geology too, you're going to find a lot of stones and things along those lines. But you know, one of my passions since I was a kid was numismatism, studying coins. And man, have they got a bunch of super cool old coins for sale in the Relic Room. I mean, that's just incredible stuff to me. And actually, it's very reasonably priced. So if you are like me and you've collected coins. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love to find like a wheat penny or something like that, or somebody would show me a buffalo nickel or something. Yeah, you can definitely add to your collection with what they've got there at the Relic Room. And they've got a lot. I mean, ancient European coins, a lot of early American coins, uh, you know, really neat stuff. So definitely check out what they've got. If you happen to be in Sevierville, Tennessee, it's worth the stop. Make sure that you go in the front doors and then head on downstairs. It's going to be on that bottom level. You won't miss it since it's expanded. It's very hard to miss. In fact, you may get lost in there for a couple of hours like I did last time I was there. And of course, while you're getting lost out there in cyberspace, my friends, I hope that you will find your way over to sevenages.org. And don't forget to check us out on Instagram, on Facebook. You know, Jason, sir, you manage our Facebook group for the Seven Ages uh, operations. And of course, there's a chat that's ongoing in there where after every episode, we're discussing things that are going on. You kind of moderate those chats. But if people hear things on these programs and they want to get involved and learn a little bit more, or if you have a question about what we discuss on the programs, in addition to being able to email us, Jason, James, or Micah at sevenages.org, you can also jump in that chat over there at Facebook and engage and maybe learn from other archaeology enthusiasts who join us there in the chat. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's always a good time. You know, we're just getting up and running, but feel free to join us. After each episode, we're going to be in there talking about what we learned and what our opinions were. So yeah, we're trying to stay on top of the uh, social media and stay engaged with everyone out there in the listening world. So yeah, feel free to join us at the Seven Ages podcast chat group over there on Facebook. It's admirable work you do, my man. You know how often I'm on social media. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Not much. (laughs) Yeah, Not much at all. But hey, you know, we're all busy and we're doing different things to to keep all of this running. And we're all very, very busy, but it's a labor of love for sure. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's one of the great things about Seven Ages. Everybody's got a different kind of role that they fulfill. Jason, you've really been kind of leading the charge a lot this year while I've been out traveling and things. But, you know, I still love the archaeology. There's so much to discuss. I love it so much, you know, on my other podcasts, I still talk about it. And so this week, it was tragic because I wasn't able to be there for the conversation with Dr. Bob Breyer. I had to take off and head out to a conference out in Arizona. I tried to make it work, but I couldn't. But I tell you what, Jason did a fantastic job, as you're about to hear. In this in-depth conversation, as we celebrate the centennial, 100 years since the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, right here in a moment when we return on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Tonight, the Seven Ages Audio Journal welcomes a very special guest. Affectionately known as Mr. Mummy, Dr. Bob Breyer is recognized as one of the world's foremost experts on mummies and Egyptology. As a senior research fellow at Long Island University Post in Brookville, New York, he has conducted pioneering research in mummification practices and has investigated some of the world's most famous mummies, including King Tut, Vladimir Lenin, Ramses the Great, Ava Perone, and many others. Dr. Breyer has many books to his name, including Cleopatra's Needle, The Lost Obelisks of Egypt, Egyptomania, The Murder of Tutankhamun, The Secret of the Great Pyramid, and the book that brings him to the show tonight, Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World, out now on Oxford University Press. Dr. Breyer, welcome to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Thank you. You don't say this too often, but you are certainly a guest that needs no introduction. Uh, You are well known in the world of Egyptology, someone that I have followed for a very long time. For our audience who may be new to you and your work, uh, let's take a moment to uh, talk about you as a person, your job in the field of Egyptology, and how you came to this discipline. Well, you asked a few questions there. (laughs) Yeah. Um, How I came to the discipline is is a very strange Root. I never intended to be an Egyptologist. I uh, had attended medical school. I was a philosopher. But what I really did was play basketball. I liked to play basketball. And I was in a tournament in, in, in New York, the Rucker, and I hurt my, my knees. Actually, um, Willis Reed, a ball player, fell on me and, and uh, wrecked my knees. And I was having operations. This is like, I don't know, 35 years ago, more. Um, I was having operations on my knees, my ACLs. And it was the old days when you had to be in your cast from your ankles to your hip for months and months. And somebody gave me a hieroglyph textbook to amuse myself with. And I taught myself hieroglyphs. I had done other languages. I had done Latin and Greek and things like that. And I like languages, but this is just a lot of fun to, to learn hieroglyphs. So I learned hieroglyphs. And then at my university, they asked me, you know, could you teach a course in hieroglyphs? And I said, yeah, I could do that. So I started teaching courses in hieroglyphs. And then my students one day said, Dr. Bryant, Dr. Bryant, we got to go to Egypt. And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. So I took 12 kids on a study tour of Egypt, and then I became an Egyptologist. I said, this is better than philosophy. So it's all basketball that led me to Egyptology. Well, there you go. And that's why I like to ask these questions, because you never know how people end up where they are in life. So I answered several of the questions that I had, and that's a a great introduction to your work. And so with that being said, how long have you actually been working both in and out of Egypt as an Egyptologist? I guess about 50 years. Just wow. about 50 years. That is, yeah. again, yeah, truly impressive. So, so long time. 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, let's get into this brand new book that is out and available now, Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World. This book is fascinating. It's one volume that really captures uh, the entire story. You know, so many times uh, you only hear on documentaries pieces and portions of the find and the politics and everything that were surrounding Tutankhamun, but this book does an excellent job of summarizing uh, the initial findings all the way through to modern technology. So let's talk a little bit about that. What inspired you to put this book together and why was it so important? Well, you know, it's the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the tomb this year. November 4th will be the exact 100th anniversary of the discovery of the tomb. And I was asked to do a book about Tutankhamun because I was always interested in him. Um, and I was trying to figure out, I wanted to do something different. You know, you don't want to say the same old, same old. Sure. Everybody knows the history of the discovery of the tomb. You know, the two, the downtrodden Egyptologist and the wealthy Lord, you know, looking for the tomb in the Valley of the Kings. They finally find it, and it's wonderful things. You know, that everybody knows that story. But I wanted to say something different, and I thought what would be interesting was to summarize the research that's been done about Tutankhamun. Now, everybody thinks that they discover the tomb, they move all the treasures to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, they're put in cases, they're on display, and that's the end of the story. But it's not. It's really just the beginning. There's a lot of research that's been done on Tutankhamun since the discovery. Really new high-tech stuff, fun stuff, different stuff. So I thought I would summarize it. And that would be an interesting book because people would hear about research on Tutankhamun. But as I got going, it didn't quite go the way I thought it would. Some of the things were as I expected, but some things weren't. For example, I got a different picture of Tutankhamun than what's normally presented. Um, you may know that there's a theory of, of Tutankhamun as having been, a, I call him the fragile pharaoh, um, that he had a club foot. Um, right. Recent CAT scans of the, of the mummies, the royal mummies, suggested that Tutankhamun had a club foot. And therefore, he may have even walked on the side of his foot for his whole life. So he would have been a fragile pharaoh, not able to do much. And then as I started doing the research, I realized this didn't ring true. It just didn't look right. I looked at the CAT scan. It didn't seem right. I looked at the other things, and it just didn't didn't seem right. So that went a different route, where I had to sort of talk about Tutankhamun as possibly a warrior, and I found evidence that he really went into battle. So a lot of different routes sort of deviated from where I intended it to go. So it's not just a book about research. It's a little bit iconoclastic. I, I do, you know, rattle a few cages. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I like most about it is, you know, you weren't afraid to tackle some of those well-established, if you will, myths, and you were able to provide a lot of proof and evidence for what you state in the book. So again, I encourage everyone to pick it up. Now, one thing that I do want to cover that was new to me as I was reading the book, uh, going back to the early days, talking about Carter and Lord Carnarvon and all of those things, I had never heard about the family of essentially looters, the Ab Air Rasuls. So oh. I would like to pick it up there because I found that to be absolutely fascinating. And I couldn't, you know, when I thought about it back, I couldn't believe that somehow I had missed something that important to uh -huh. the story. So tell us a little bit about that family in that time period. Sure. Well, b before Carter and Carnarvon really got going, it was the Wild West days of Egyptology and of, out of antiquities. There was, a, there was a very vibrant antiquity trade. You could buy all kinds of antiquities on the market. Even the Egyptian Museum in Cairo was selling Egyptian antiquities. They had a sale room where you could go and you could buy a mummy and a coffin and whatever you wanted. Um, so it was really an open business. But there were legal and illegal deals going on. And there was one family of, of tomb robbers. They were illicit. They didn't have licenses to do this thing called the Razuls. And in the 1870s, in the 1870s, they made the discovery of all time. Up until then, no one had ever seen the mummy of a pharaoh. The pharaohs had been buried in the Valley of the Kings, but all the tombs had been robbed, and all the mummies were gone. And then, in the 1870s, all of a sudden, royal objects started appearing on the antiquities market. Gold bracelets with queens' names on them. Papyri with kings' names on them. And everybody figured somebody's found a royal tomb. And they did. It was the Razul families. They had found this fabulous cache of all the, all the royal mummies from the Valley of the Kings. At some point, the tombs had been robbed, but the mummies were still there in the tombs. It was the treasures that were taken. And a pharaoh, a later pharaoh, decided, we have to protect the ancestors. We have to protect the bodies of these pharaohs. So he put them 
in one large secret tomb high up away from the Valley of the Kings. And there they stayed for 3,000 years till the Razuls found them. And you know that they were skilled tomb robbers. They had interesting techniques for finding. You know, how, do you, how do you find a hidden tomb? Well, the answer is you wait for the rain. Every once in a while in Egypt, in the south, you do get rainstorms. And they go out in the rain, and they look on the ground for where the water's disappearing. Where does it go running into? And where it runs into is probably a hole, a cave, a tomb. And they saw this water running in. They started digging. They, indeed, they found all the royal mummies, 40 royal mummies of kings, the, the great ones of Egypt. They found Ramses the Great. I mean, all kinds of the great pharaohs. So this was a great, great discovery. And it was the Razuls who found him. That's actually really interesting. And I've, I've got a question that's kind of off topic a little bit, but it's about the Valley of the Kings. What is the bedrock there? Is that the same type of limestone that's uh, under the uh, pyramid complex, or is it a different type of bedrock, do you, if, you, if you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's similar limestone. You know, there are several kinds of limestone throughout Egypt. There are really, in a sense, two major kinds. There's rather crude, crumbly, not so fine, not so white limestone. That's used on the interior of the Great Pyramid. They, they, that's all those blocks inside. But then on the outside, they have this beautiful white limestone, pearly white limestone. That's the stuff that's in the Valley of the Kings also. So it's really fine white limestone in the Valley of the Kings. Okay. That's still super interesting. And obviously, it's going to get a lot of groundwater intrusion through there. That's what made me think of that when you yeah. talked about the water again. I was like, oh, is that, you know, is that karst topography too? Wasn't sure. Yeah, but they planned for it. The, 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 the ancient tomb builders planned for it. They had things that they called the well, and they would, they would sink a pit before the burial chamber. So if water ran into the tomb, it would go down into this artificial well or the pit that they dug, and it wouldn't destroy the, the tomb. So they planned for it. These guys knew what they were doing. Yeah, master engineers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, returning for just a moment to that cache, because it is something that's so astounding. From what I understand in your book, it appears that the uh, the later dynasties had repaired and rewrapped a lot of the mummies. So to talk about that a little bit, is there any way that you could differentiate between the original condition versus the repaired condition later on? Yes. Um, no, it's, a, it's a very good question. We can tell the difference when a mummy has been repaired or restored. Very often the bandage coloring is different, and usually the first wrappings, the, the original wrappings, will have hieroglyphs on telling the king magical spells, things like that. The second wrapping, the restoration wrapping, very often has a note by a priest saying that he rewrapped the august mummy of the pharaoh and, and did this. So he was sort of taking credit for restoring the body of the ancestors. So we can tell the difference. We can. Again, a fascinating observation there from that particular cache. So what do we see as we begin to move through the history of, I know, you know, looting and, and the sell of antiquities from Egypt, all, including all over the world, has always been a longstanding problem. But at that time in the late 1870s into the early 1900s, what was done to sort of uh, curb that sell? And I know there were some key characters mentioned in the book that really put forth a strong effort to try to keep those treasures in Egypt. So tell us a little bit about, you described it as the Wild West, but what was yeah. the mentality at that time? Well, the, the mentality wasn't, it was not that everything found in Egypt stays in Egypt. The feeling was it's okay, for example, for the Egyptian museum to sell their duplicates. So they had a sale room and they would sell them to museums. They would sell them to tourists coming through. This was a source of income for them. Now, they were realists. They knew that there were people illicitly dealing in antiquities, and they knew that there were people who were finding great things and the Egyptian museum would buy objects from illegal dealers. They would often want to get them for the museum, and they had a budget for actually buying things on the market even. So it was a very wide-open thing. Now, eventually, in 1912, they started giving out licenses to dealers. So now, in order to be a dealer, you had to have a license. You pay for it. You pay about maybe 20 bucks or something in those days, and you get a license to sell antiquities. And there were about 100 of these licensed antiquity dealers throughout Egypt who were selling the duplicates for the museums and things like that. So there were lots of them. Um, there were gray areas. There were, there were legal dealers. There were illegal dealers. It remained fairly wide open until the discovery of Tutankhamun. And, you know, as, as you mentioned, the title of the book 
is Tutankhamun and the tomb that changed the world. It's not just hype. You know, I didn't want to just put that in as if, oh, it changed the world. It really did change the world. And one of the things I think that Tutankhamun's discovery, the tomb, is that it changed the antiquities laws. It changed the way that people looked at antiquities in Egypt. You know, Tutankhamun's mummy is the only mummy ever found in its tomb. Only royal mummy ever found in its tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Every other one had been robbed, looted, moved, etc. So when Tut's tomb is found, it's, it's realized at some point that this should all stay together. None of Tut's stuff should leave the valley. Now, there were plenty of duplicates. There were lots of things. Tut had six chariots. He had more than 500 servant statues, little statues to serve him in the next world. And Carnarvon and, and Carter really thought they were going to get some of the duplicates. That was kind of the, their thinking, at least. Um, but they didn't. And, and then... When Carter and Carnarvon ran into trouble with the, you know, with, with the public and they made some bad decisions, all of a sudden the Egyptians rose up and said, this is our tomb. It should stay here. And that led to the changing of Egyptian antiquity laws, where there used to be, always, there was what was called in French, partage, the division of the fines. If you excavate in Egypt, you get to keep some of it, maybe half of it. Then, and they, they would divide it like kids divide it. At the end of the excavation season, archaeologists would take all their finds, all the statues, the scarabs, the this, the that, and they'd put it in two piles, one on one table, one on another table, and somebody from the antiquities department would come and pick whichever pile he wanted for the museum. And the muse- and the other, the excavator got to take it back to his university or his museum or whatever. Um, so there was a division of the finds. After Tutankhamun, you know, there's not going to be any divisions of the finds soon. So that really did change the way that everybody viewed antiquities in Egypt. That's, you know, absolutely astounding when you stop to think about it. And, you know, as I was reading through your book and you were describing some of the royal mummies that had been looted in antiquity, uh, yeah. it led to a question that I want to ask you now. The heart scarab that you describe of the cutting through when they were yeah. looking through different royal mummies for that particular item and then later realizing possibly that it had already been taken in antiquity. So, so much was put into these tombs, into the pharaoh's burial treasure chambers, into the coffins and sarcophagus themselves. So the obvious disrespect of looting the tomb, uh, was the average Egyptian at the time of the pharaohs not aware of the importance of those things? Did they not have a fear of the magic that have you know, the spirituality and the magic that had been used on the tombs. Talk a little bit about the average person who would, I guess, dare to Mm -hmm. desecrate a royal mummy. Yeah. You know, I think people are people everywhere. The same as nowadays. There are people who believe in religion, believe in heaven, believe in this, believe in that. And there are people who don't. For the most part, most Egyptians really believed in the religion, right? And it was resurrection. They believed that the body was literally going to get up and go again in the next world. That's why they mummified. You had to have your body in the next world. But there were some people, obviously the tomb robbers, who didn't believe it. They didn't buy into it. And they were the ones who went after the bodies and the treasures that were on the bodies. Yeah, and so it it leads to, again, as we look back in time, that time period that you discussed where those antiquities of royal nature began to come onto the market. Have any of those ever been uh, rediscovered? Have they been found in museums, uh, private collections, or anything like that uh, where you could actually trace them back to that original time period around the 1870s? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You can can believe it. Well, I have a little chapter. I have a chapter in um, the book about, about... stolen artifacts from Tutankhamun's tomb. And for example, the little servant statues that were in Tutankhamun's tomb, there were more than 500 of them. I saw one on display in the Louvre Museum in Paris just a few years ago, in a case right there. And I, there it was, a Tutankhamun. And there's no place that that could have come other than the tomb of Tutankhamun. And about six months ago, I was at a conference where the former director of the Louvre, the Egyptian collection, was there, and I asked him about it. I said, what about this Tutankhamun Ushapti? They're called Ushapti. It's just an ancient Egyptian word for, for answerer, because they're going to answer for you and do the work in the next world. I said, what about the Tutankhamun Ushapti? Where'd you get it? And he said, we bought it from the estate 
of Howard Carter's secretary. And then he smiled and he said, but you know, Howard Carter didn't have a secretary. (laughs) And what happened was, I think it was sold by the estate of Howard Carter's niece. Howard Carter didn't have any children. He never married. And he had one family member with whom he was very close, his niece. And she would come out and visit him in Egypt and things like that. And I think when she died, her effects were sold. And the Louvre bought this to Tankamanu Shapti. Uncle Howard must have given it to her. Again, fascinating. And that's why we wanted to have you, Dr. Breyer, on the show, because you know all of the backstory to uh, many of these items, and it it makes for a fascinating read. So uh, we're going to return to some of the artifacts that were surrounding uh, the tomb of Tutankhamun a little bit later on, but let's learn a little bit about the man himself. So through everything that you've been involved with writing this book and your research over the years, modern technology and everything that's been used, what have we discovered about Tutankhamun himself. And, you know, I want your opinion on this because I've often heard him referred to as a rather minor pharaoh as in terms of importance. So what are your thoughts on him as a person? Yeah, well, first, I don't think he's really that minor. I think he has much greater import than people credit him with. Now, he only reigned for 10 years, short reign, especially when you consider that he took over the throne when he's only about 10 years old, nine or 10 years old. So obviously in the beginning, he's not calling the shots. Someone is making decisions for him. But it's a very, very, very important time. Remember, his father was the heretic Pharaoh Akhenaten, the Pharaoh who said, there's only one God. First time in history that we get anybody being a monotheist, recorded as a monotheist saying, there's only one God. Right. This is way before Christianity. It's before Judaism. This is big news. And it's so unpopular that Akhenaten, the father, has to move out of town. He has to start a new city in the desert and with his new religion, his new followers. So this is a big deal. Now, when Akhenaten dies, what are they going to do? Are they going to continue with the new religion or are they going to go back to the old religion? Well, the decision is made. We go back to the old religion. So Tutankhamun is the one who's there when this transition is being made. And as he grows up, he's the one who's affecting the transition, saying, I'm not like dad. I'm not a heretic. I don't believe in this crazy new religion. I'm traditional. So I think he's not a minor pharaoh at all. He's he's a major player in a return to the old religion and the good old days of Egypt. So in that way, I think he's very, very important. And he's also important for like 25 other reasons. You know, he's got, look, look at the tomb. It's the only tomb ever found intact of a pharaoh. Right. We now know what a pharaoh's burial must have looked like. Now, he was only 10 years in his reign. He dies when he's about 19, so it must have been unexpected. So imagine what other pharaoh's tombs were like, but at least we get a glimpse into what the rituals were like for the pharaoh, what the coffins were like, what the sarcophagus was like. So, no, no, he's not so minor as people like to say. Yeah, and I really appreciate your viewpoint on that. And I think we would be remiss, especially for the listeners who may not be as familiar, but let's back up for a moment and talk about his lineage, because the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten and the establishment of Amarna, right? it wasn't just you know the religion, everything changed, the art style, the way that they depicted themselves. And you know, as anyone who's familiar with Akhenaten knows, he was very bizarre. And the way that he was portrayed in the Amarna style of art. Let's yeah. talk about him and his influence and, and what kind of situation that would have created for Tutankhamun. Sure. Well, one of the things to understand about the Egyptians is they were extremely conservative. They didn't like change. And even in their art, you know, if you go into a museum and you look at an Egyptian statue from 2500 BC, it looks pretty much like a statue from 1500 BC. A thousand years later, and you take that 1500 BC statue and now look at one from 500 BC, looks the same again. So for thousands of years, they didn't change the art. As a matter of fact, they wanted to make sure it didn't it didn't change. So when you had a statue, you would take out an old one and you'd copy a new one. Or when you're painting a tomb, they put down a grid in red ink squares, and it basically became paint by numbers. If the head was two squares, the shoulders are five squares, down to the hips, it's four and a half squares. So all the proportions are always the same. 
It never changes. That's why when people go into an, in a museum, they look at it, and all Egyptian art looks pretty much the same. Now, with Akhenaten, he changed it. I mean, radically. What, what a change. He had himself shown as almost deformed. The statues of him we have show a very, very wide-hipped man, narrow waist, elongated face, elongated nose, his hands are elongated. It's even led some people to think that he had a disease called Marfan syndrome, which makes you look like this. So he allowed himself to be shown as almost deformed. No pharaoh ever did that. I mean, they are always shown as broad-shouldered, handsome, well-muscled, striding into eternity. Not Akhenaten. Also, he allowed himself to be shown in daily life scenes with his kids. You know, you got kids climbing all over him. He's got another kid on his lap. He's eating a duck. That's unusual. That's very unusual. And then he creates this new god, the Aten, the solar disk, who's, you know, he's so different from other gods, the Aten. Every other god in Egypt, you can view him as a person. You know, you have Isis, who's a woman. You have Amun, who looks like a man. You have Bess, who's a dwarf, who looks a little bit like a lion. You have Bastet, who has a cat-headed goddess. You can, you can depict them. You have an image of them. This is an abstract god. He's just a solar disk. And the people didn't get it. They didn't get it at all. I mean, people weren't jumping on this new religion at all. So he had to move out of town. So I think you know, he was a real visionary. I mean, he had, he had sight. You know, he, he was doing something different. As they would say in jazz, he was, he was putting it down, but the people weren't picking it up. I mean, they just didn't get it. So he had to move out of town. And then... Tut comes back and tries to put it all back together. It was really interesting times. You know, the people didn't know what to make of him. I mean, they stand, you know, look, put it this way. They didn't even know if they would resurrect in the next world. This religion didn't have anything about resurrection. Doesn't say you're going to get up and go again in the next world. I mean, so what if you're a guy who's, you know, you're, say you're a, a fairly well-established businessman in Egypt, and you've built your tomb, you put all your money into this really fancy tomb, and now the pharaoh's saying, we don't know if there's resurrection? You're going to give it up? You're going to go with him into the desert? No, you'll stay with resurrection. So very, very strange times. Unique in all of Egypt, really. They just didn't like change, and this guy was shaking everything up. So did Tut, did he live in the, the, the city in the desert, or did he come back to the, main, to the main civilization? Tut is born in the city in the desert. His father is Akhenaten, and his mother is one of the minor wives. We think Kia. So he's born in this city, and for 10 years, he grows up with nothing but this Amarna religion. Never leaves the city, Akhenaten never leaves the city, and all he knows is the Aten. Then his father dies. Now, Tut is only 9 or 10 years old. What do you do? Do you go with the new religion and stay at Amarna, or do you return to, say, Thebes, to Luxor, and go back to the old religion? Now, Little nine-year-old Tut isn't going to make that decision. Someone like the vizier, the overseer, is going to make that. And the decision is made. They give up the new religion. And within a period of about two years, that new city in the desert, Tel Alamorna, is abandoned completely. And to give you an idea of how fast it's abandoned and with how much enthusiasm it's abandoned, they leave behind all the art. Nobody's taking any souvenirs. It's not unlike Nazi Germany. People aren't taking souvenirs of Hitler. You know, after they lose the war, nobody's a Nazi. And it's like that with Amarna. The fabulous bust of Nefertiti, that famous, famous icon of beauty, is left behind in the sculptor's studio. Nobody wants it. And it's left behind with other statues of the Amarna period. People aren't taking anything back. They're leaving. And I think they're happy to go see their friends again. They've been living in the city for 10 years, isolated. Akhenaten says, we're never going to leave. And Egypt is going downhill. The economy's going down. The military's going down in this time when you have this eccentric pharaoh. So I think people were happy to go back to the old time. So while Tut probably doesn't make that decision, he's going along with it. And again, that really paints a good picture of all the pressure that may have been on him to uh, bring back the old gods and bring back the old ways and reopen the old temples. And that is a immense amount of pressure for especially someone as young uh, in the position that he is as Pharaoh. 
So some of those early things that we discussed here tonight about the club foot and some uh, Mm -hmm. myths and mysteries around him as a person, what would the items found in his tomb indicate about him that is in opposition to those uh, previously believed images of the Pharaoh? Yeah. Any, anything particular? Yeah. Let me, let me tell you how this idea of the uh, Tutankhamun as a warrior arose, because it'll give you a good idea of the kind of, it's, it's almost like a, a detective story where you're looking for the clues, trying to figure it out, make it all make sense. Well, everybody knew that Tut dies at the age of 19. Good, good. Later, after the discovery, much later, we get CAT scans of the pharaoh's body, of Tut's body. And someone on the team of radiologists says, it looks like he has a club foot. And he walked on the side of his foot. You know, and I looked at the CAT scan. I didn't quite see a club foot. I really didn't see it. And neither did an orthopedic surgeon who wrote in and said, wait a second, I don't see a club foot either. And then I started thinking, if Tutankhamun really did have a club foot, how come the other anatomists who had examined the mummy in the last 40 years, how come none of them ever picked up on it? For example, Tutankhamun was buried with gold sandals on his feet. Gold sandals for eternity, because gold doesn't, doesn't tarnish. Now. The first anatomist to examine Tut in, 19, in, in 1924 is Douglas Derry. And he's the one who took off the gold sandals. Now, he's taken off the gold sandals around the ankles. Where's the club foot? He didn't notice anything. And then, in the 1960s, we get another radiologist. We get a radiologist, Harrison, who x-rays Tut. And he never sees anything like a club foot. And then I started thinking more. Well, look, if he's got a club foot, wouldn't it affect the other bones in the lower leg, the tibia and fibula, right? No, they're perfect. They're perfect. I mean, you know how it is when, when somebody limps, it's going to affect his pelvis. He's going to have a, you know, a, a femur that's in trouble and things like that. So it didn't make sense. It really didn't make sense. And then when I started going through the new things in the tomb that I, that I didn't know about, for example, Tut had a suit of armor. He actually had a suit of armor made of leather, made of leather scales that were sewn together, overlapping. And the experts who examined it determined that it actually had been worn. So here he has this fragile pharaoh, not really, has a suit of armor. Not only that, he's shown on a painted box going into war on his chariot. And he's buried with six chariots. Not only that, He's buried with two dozen bows and hundreds of arrows. So you've got loads and loads and loads of clues that this guy wasn't fragile and he may have even been a warrior. I'll give you one more little bit of evidence that has come up fairly recently, which is interesting. Very often, the pharaohs showed themselves on their temples in battle. They wanted to be shown as heroic. They're in their chariots. They're shooting arrows. They're never missing. There's always the enemy with the arrows in him and never an Egyptian soldier with an arrow in him. Tut had a a chapel that was dismantled. It was taken down and the blocks were used by other pharaohs. But some of those blocks have been found recently. And the picture has been sort of put back together and it shows Tut in battle, actually in battle. And not only that, there are scenes that don't appear anywhere else which suggest that it really did happen. You know, when when the Egyptians conquered The way they counted the number of dead that they had killed of the enemy is they cut off their hands and they made a huge pile of hands and a military accountant, a scribe, counted the number of hands. Well, in Tut's battle scene, it's not quite like that. He's got his soldiers coming back with hands skewered on their spears. So you get each soldier with four or five hands on their spear, almost like war trophies. And this suggests there's something really happened like that. So I think when you put it all together, I think Tutankhamun may very well have been a warrior pharaoh. I think you're making a pretty good case for that. Just knowing young men, you know, I've been a young guy at some point in my life. Right, right. But if I died young and I was the pharaoh, I would probably have a lot of hot rods, right? All those chariots, he's yep. got his bows, all the stuff he likes is all in there with him. You know, yes. I would think that if I was, I would think if I was disabled, I wouldn't, probably wouldn't have that stuff and I wouldn't want to be seen by the people 
you know, if I was, you know, I had a club foot or somehow couldn't properly ride in the chariot. So he probably, you know, enjoyed that. And maybe even the chariots might have been outfitted in some way if he had some physical limitation because you got to stand up in the chariot. I'm sure that's, you know, it takes a lot of balance and a lot of skill to, you know, to drive the chariot. Right, you are, James. And let me let me give you another little datum, a little little fact that I think supports what you're saying. We have two tank almond shoes. We have more than two dozen pairs of two tank almond sandals, and they're worn equally. You, you know, you would you would be asymmetrical up the wazoo if 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 he really had dragged yeah. his foot. So yeah, there's there no signs of this asymmetry at all. Yeah, all very good points. Again, uh, much of this is covered in the book, Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World. Again, that is available now. We are speaking tonight with Dr. Bob Breyer. So picking up the conversation, uh, let's jump back one more time to November 1st, 1922. Let's talk a little bit about the initial discovery, uh, Howard Carter, and what was found. So we start with the antechamber, correct? Yes. They, 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 on November 4th, 1922, they find a step leading down into the ground in the Valley of the Kings. They've been looking for Tut's tomb for years. They knew there was a minor pharaoh, they thought, didn't know much about him. They're looking for him, and they find this step going down into the ground. There's a long descending passageway. This step, this passageway down is filled with rubble to deter tomb robbers. So they've got to clear that out. Then they see a wall. There's a wall that's been bricked up, plastered over, and seals of the necropolis. The officials of the Valley of the Kings have sealed it. They can see that it looks like it's been resealed. Somebody may have gone in, but they want to see what's in there. So they put a little hole in this wall. They reach in the candle. Carter looks in, and Carnarvon can't wait. And he says, what do you see? And Carter says the famous one, wonderful things, wonderful things. So they see this antechamber, as you correctly call it. It's not the burial chamber. This is a room before the burial chamber. And it's about the size of a living room, though. It's a pretty big room. And it's packed with stuff. I mean packed. There are four chariots in there. There's statues, life-size statues of Tutankhamun. There's chests. There's couches. There's funeral beds. Everything you can imagine. Treasures. So it's packed chock-a-block. It'll take more than a year to clear that out. Carter is a really good excavator. He's, he's doing it right. He's going slowly. He's photographing everything. First archaeologist to photograph everything in situ. Nothing's going to be moved until it's photographed. We want to know what it looked like when it was first found. Then they have to move the thing slowly. Sometimes you'll move one item, then it reveals another. Let's photograph again. And they do this for a year, removing things carefully and carefully. And then finally, eventually, they're going to get to the burial chamber. Now, up until this point, by the way, so little is known about Tutankhamun that they don't know he's a boy king. They don't know he died at the age of 19. And as a matter of fact, as soon as they discover the tomb, you start to get 1920s songs, you know, the sheet music that they used to have for piano and things like that, with songs like Old King Tut Was a Wise Old Nut. So the idea is everybody viewed him as an old guy. And on the sheet music of that one, Old King Tut was a wise old nut. It shows this old pharaoh with a cigar in his mouth. So nobody even knew that he was a boy king until they got to the burial chamber. And then they actually got the mummy of Tutankhamun. So it was, it was great excitement. It took years to excavate. It would take Carter 10 years to clear the tomb completely. If you've never seen or had the opportunity to see some of these items that come from the tomb, they are simply Artistry is simply amazing and breathtaking, and it's unlike anything uh, that you'll see anywhere else. So I want to talk about that for just a moment. So the artistry, the ability of the the craftsmen and the, and the artists at that time is second to none. And I've always been interested in their ability to shape uh, gold and copper and silver and all of those things, great jewelers and you know, metallurgists. So, you know, something as complicated as Tut's throne with that scene that's on the back of it. What do we know about the artists who were creating this? What was their level uh, or their position in society? Well, first of all, these, of course, were royal artists. These were the top, top of the line goldsmiths, carvers, carpenters. These guys were the top of the line. They didn't sign their works. We don't have artworks. 
signed in ancient Egypt. So when you mention the fabulous gold throne of Tutankhamun, which is really a wood throne that's carved and then covered with a thin gold sheeting, which is fabulous, but nobody signs it because the Egyptians didn't view it as creative. They viewed it as craft. It's skilled. It's wonderful. But they're not into creativity. They're not, they don't want you to change anything. They don't want you to do anything new. They just want wonderful things like we've had in the past. So these guys have had now, remember, the goldsmiths by now, by Tutankhamun's time, they've been goldsmiths for more than a thousand years in Egypt. They've had plenty of time to perfect their craft. They've been doing stuff forever. And to Tut, as Pharaoh, he's got all the gold he needs. So they can do beautiful. It's, it's a little bit on the clunky side, I, I think. It's big, heavy stuff, you know, the the big gold things that he wore and, and things like that. But it's still spectacular stuff. But this is top-of-the-line royal craftsmen who would have been well-paid for their work and well-appreciated, but they didn't get to sign their work. So as we're talking about this, you know, the, the practical uh, performance of some of this stuff occurs to me, you know, and I, I like to think about this stuff. And, you know, if, you, if a pharaoh is getting on in years, there's some preparation being made, right? But if a pharaoh dies at 19, somebody's got to pull this thing out pretty quickly, you know, and get it set up. And I'm sure that it was a, a major undertaking at the time and, you know, and of incredible importance as well. Yeah, I think everybody was thrown into chaos. I think when, when Tut dies at the age of 19, they've only got 70 days to get everything ready. That was the ritual. The mummy had to be in the tomb 70 days after death. So all of these things had to be pulled together in 70 days. Now, for a pharaoh like Ramses the Great, who rules for 67 years, he's got plenty of time to get his chariots ready, get his jewelry, get this ready. Not Tut. It's a small tomb, hastily prepared, hastily prepared. And they're getting all this stuff together. And there's signs of it. There's signs of haste. It's wonderful, but there's signs of haste. For example, the stone sarcophagus that he's buried in was made for someone else. We can see that parts have been erased and it's been recarved. Many of the objects have been made for someone else. So they're pulling together things maybe from other royal tombs even, from other things that hadn't been finished. And they're getting it all together as fast as they can and putting it in the tomb. No, they, it was must have been a wild time. So that, that was sort of my question, I guess, is tell or what there was a lot of haste or and had all of those materials and all those those uh, items been produced specifically for Tutankhamun or, you know, do they come elsewhere because of the time crunch? And it sounds like that that's what's the case. Yeah, even even yes. And even some of them were heirlooms, things that his grandfather had. Now, he's not going to take anything from McNaughton. He's not going to take anything from dad because he's the heretic. But they're looking for things that they can pick that are heirlooms. And there's one object that I thought was maybe the most fascinating object in the tomb. It's a dagger. And it was on Tutankhamun's body, right? Had it with him. Now, what makes it really interesting, really interesting, is it's iron. It's a, it's a thing of beauty. The blade is iron. The hilt is gold. And the pommel, the part you grab with your hand, is rock crystal. So it's this fabulously beautiful object made of iron. Now, what's interesting is Egypt didn't have iron when Tutankhamun was alive. There was no iron objects in Egypt. Where did Tut get this thing, right? Now, the answer is it came from outer space. Now, I don't mean ancient aliens, but the iron came from a meteorite. And one of the words that the Egyptians, or phrase that the Egyptians had for iron was iron from the sky. So they knew that meteorites had iron, and they must have seen meteorites crashing. The Tut had this iron dagger in his tomb with him. Now, the interesting thing is this, and this is where the heirloom part comes in. Scientists eventually realized that this was meteoritic iron. So using Google Earth, they looked for a meteor crater in Egypt, and they found one in the southern border of Egypt, remote area in the desert, they found an impact site. And what was really cool, nobody had seen it yet. You couldn't see tire tracks. It's in the remote part of the desert. So geologists went out to examine it. And it took them three days to get there. 
over the sand, four wheel drives, all that. And they get there and sure enough, it's a meteorite, meteorite impact site, hundreds of little meteorites fractured from the big, big baby that's in the ground. And they bring back samples, loads of samples. And they compare the meteorite samples with touch dagger. And they don't match. The meteorite has a different composition of different percentage of iron and nickel than the dagger. So it didn't come from Egyptian meteorites. But, 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 in the ancient Egyptian records, we have a record of a dagger being given by a foreign king from Mitanni, where they did have iron, given by a foreign king from Mitanni to Tut's grandfather, King Amenhotep III, and it says it's a dagger of iron and gold. So I think Tutankhamun is being buried with granddad's dagger, and it's an heirloom that he takes with him to the next world. Yes, that is absolutely incredible. I've seen the photos of that, and I was it is an absolutely stunning, stunning artifact. Uh, you know, it's fun. I, you know, the chapter that I talk about it is called It Came From Outer Space, and, and I think there's going to be a lot of ancient alien guys who are very disappointed. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. But again, uh, as we're talking about this, like dying at 19, you know, obviously that's going to shake things up. He's just getting the old gods and, and the old ways back up and running. So it would have been a very turbulent time, I would imagine. Uh, so one more thing that you mentioned in the book that I think is of key importance here is the guidebooks to the next world. So rather than having the typical expected book of the dead, uh, what did Tutankhamun have in place of that? Yeah, you, you, you're right. He didn't have a Book of the Dead. And I think because he died suddenly. Books of the Dead take a long time to prepare. They're papyrus scrolls that are as long as 100 feet. And they have to have paintings all over them, hieroglyphs, things like that. So he didn't have a Book of the Dead. The closest thing he had, and this may have been taken from another pharaoh even, we're not sure. He was buried inside three nested coffins. The innermost was solid gold. So you have these three coffins inside a stone sarcophagus, and all of that was surrounded by four shrines, nested shrines, one inside the other, like Russian dolls. And on these shrines are magical spells to help Tutankhamun get to the next world. So instead of a Book of the Dead, he's got these magical spells. It's called the Book of the Gates, actually. They believed he's going to go through different gates to get to the next world. And that's the best he had. They had to pull it together very quickly. So on those shrines, we have all these spells for Tut getting to the next world. It's so much to be learned. You know, again, the imagination runs wild. If you could have saw Seti the first or Ramses the second's tomb, what those have looked like. Someone who had a full life to, to prepare the tomb. Uh, it must have truly been amazing. But one more thing, uh, you mentioned that the dagger was, you know, to you, one of the most impressive objects. And, and I completely agree with that it is absolutely fabulous. But something that really struck me as far as what was found in there is the structure that was built to contain the canopic jars. Uh, for yeah. Tut. So give us a description of that. And, and have you actually seen that in person? Oh, sure. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen almost all the artifacts in person of, from, from Tut's tomb. Yeah, uh, you mentioned canopic jars. As, as, you, as you know, of course, the Egyptians preserved the internal organs. They had to take them out at the time of mummification. They took out the stomach, liver, intestines, kidneys. They had to take them all out or else the body would decay. So they dehydrated them and put them in jars, four jars. And then these jars were placed in a beautiful calcite chest. I mean, it's beautiful, beautiful chest. And each jar has the head of a pharaoh on it. But if you look very carefully, very carefully at the faces of the four jar lids, those lids that look like a pharaoh, I think you'll see they've been altered. They weren't tuts originally. There was a cobra on each one maybe and it was carved off. Maybe it was used for a woman. It could have been used for Nefertiti. We don't know who, but this wasn't originally Tut's. That's how they're getting it all together. This this fabulous calcite chest and all that, not Tut's originally. But while as beautiful as it is, royal as it is, I don't think it was made for Tut. But it's a spectacular object, like you say, and it contains the internal organ. That's one of the things, by the way, that I've been looking for for the last 20 years. 
touch internal organs. Inside the canopic chest, the organs were placed in the jars, and those organs were placed in little gold coffinettes, little miniature coffins. So there'd be one for the stomach, maybe one for liver, intestines, kidneys. These little, and they were found. I mean, we, Carter opened them. Like you could see, it was wrapped up. The, the organs were wrapped up, but they disappeared. I haven't been able to find them. I don't know where they are. And the reason I want them is if I could do a forensic examination, if I could get his stomach, for example, I could tell if he died suddenly, his stomach would be full, right? Or did he have a long lingering disease, in which case his stomach might be empty? So you could tell some things forensically from the internal organs, but they disappeared. I, I found, you know, Tut was buried with two fetuses in the tomb. His wife, his teenage wife, Anka Sanaman, had had two miscarriages, and those little fetuses were mummified and placed in little coffins. I found them. They disappeared for a couple of years, and I found them in the anatomy department at Casarolini Hospital, where they'd been taken. And I was hoping that the internal organs would be there, but I didn't find them there. So I'm still looking. So if anybody finds Tutankhamun's internal organs, please let me know. I'm not even sure what to say about that, but I, I do have a question, just a mummification question, just in in general. What's the difference? Major differences between the Egyptian mummification process and the modern day mummification process for like linen and Avita and all you know sure. in the last hundred years or so. Yeah. Well, the, the the mummification process in Egypt is different from modern embalming. The function of modern embalming is to preserve the body for a short period till burial, so it doesn't decay, no problem, no health problems. So with modern mummification, you, what you're doing with embalming is you, you're perfusing the body with fluids, with formalin, things that will retard bacteria. That's that. All the internal organs stay in. It's simple. It's real easy. With mummification, it's much more of an art, ancient Egyptian mummification, because they wanted the body to last forever. So they've got to dehydrate it. Bacteria will not act on tissue if there's moisture there. They need tissue. That's why you can have beef jerky and it's safe to go camping with it. You put it in your backpack and you, you chew on it as you go along. And that's why you can even have blueberries in your cereal when you buy a box of Special K and it's got blueberries in it. That's really a mummy of a blueberry, right? The blueberry has been dehydrated, right? So that's the idea with, with Egyptian mummification. Dehydrate so it'll last forever. So it's much more complex. And these guys were pretty skilled. You know, you had to pull out the internal organs. You had to do this and that. Then they had all these rituals, religious rituals, the wrappings. There were amulets inside the wrappings to protect the neck, to protect the arms, to give power to the legs. Even on the bandages, they were writing magical spells. So it's a whole ritual and technical aspect to it, anatomical aspect. It's a big deal. The embalmers were really skilled. There's so many examples uh, from various time periods of, you know, changes, uh, wrapping styles uh, and different things that you see from the Greco-Roman period, you know, just different time periods. Yeah, it's all very interesting in the way that they did it. Uh, You talked about forensics there, Dr. Breyer, and I want to return to that for just a moment. Is there anything through any of the scans, CT scans, x-rays or anything that gives us a good solid clue to what may have brought King Tut's reign to an end? Anything that shows what may have caused his death? The, the short answer is no. Uh, you mentioned in, in, in the introduction that I wrote a book called The Murder of Tutankhamun. I had a theory. I still hold that theory that Tutankhamun was murdered. Now, most of my evidence is circumstantial. It's that his, his widow was writing strange letters to foreign kings saying, I'm afraid, never will I be married to a, far, to a servant of mine. It's all kinds of strange circumstances. But also, Harrison who x-rayed Tutankhamun in the 60s, pointed to a spot at the back of the head on an x-ray and said, this could have been a blow to the back of the head. So I thought that maybe he's whacked on the back of the head. Anka Sanaman knows he's been killed, and she's afraid that she might be next. So the blow to the back of the head was what I thought in the 1980s when I wrote this book, I guess. I thought he had been murdered by a blow to the back of the head. The later CAT scan, which is really good, not an x-ray, but later the CAT scan, which is better, showed that it wasn't a blow to the back of the head. So that's wrong. He wasn't killed by a blow to the back of the head, and I changed my theory that way. Um, But we don't know what killed him. We have the mummy, but we don't have it. Don't have any real forensic showing poison, um, things like that. 
you might be able to do stuff in the future. I think techniques are getting better and better. If the, if the Egyptians will give us access to the body to take a few samples, I don't know. But we don't know what killed the pharaoh. Well, that mystery will remain. And Dr. Breyer, as we begin to wrap things up here, if the listeners or anyone out there, you know, they're planning to go to Egypt. I'm planning on going at some point in the next few years. And I understand that the Grand Egyptian Museum is open or about to be open. So can you give us a description of that as far as is there going to be a new way of displaying? And I know they have labs built into the uh, museum there. Tell us a little bit about the Grand Egyptian Museum and what they should expect when visiting. Sure. It is not open yet. It's still about to open. It's been about to open for the last five years. I think the problem with the Grand Museum is it's too big. They just keep building and building and building. I think you'll see many, many more Tutankhamun objects on display than ever before because they've got so much room. So you'll see, for example, the armor that Tutankhamun may have worn into battle. That was never on display, ever. You'll see all kinds of things that, that haven't been on display. So I think it, it's worth going. But let me say this. All the Tutankhamun objects are going to the Grand Egyptian Museum. But if you go quickly, if you go soon, you will still get to see Tutankhamun in his tomb. The mummy has not been moved yet. I think people are a little hesitant about working with human bodies, with dead bodies. And I think nobody really wanted to move tight yet. But he's still in his tomb in a glass case. And you can see him up close. And I think it's kind of cool that he's still in his tomb. So touch still in the tomb but all the objects will be on display soon in the Grand Egyptian Museum. And you'll see the dagger. You'll see all the things we're talking about today. Yes, it will truly be fantastic and an incredible opportunity for those of us who love this type of thing to go see. And I'm sure, again, like we said, the displays will be top notch. And uh, Yeah, you won't be disappointed. Yeah, that's for sure. So very much looking forward to that. Dr. Breyer, as we wrap things up here, the 100th anniversary of the discovery and his legacy. So in, in with your closing thoughts, tell us to you, what is Tutankhamun's legacy and what should people get from viewing his treasures and from reading your book? Well, I think from viewing the treasures, everybody should get a sense of how deeply religious the Egyptians were. All of these objects are related to life after death. I mean, he's taking all his treasures with him to the next world. So these guys really believed in it for, for 3000 years. And I think it's a good insight into ancient Egyptian religion. Um, one thing I think of his legacy is that certainly we get a new understanding that these artifacts should remain in Egypt, perhaps. They're, they're, they're Egyptian heritage, and we, and we understand that. But I'll tell you a funny legacy. I'll, I'll end on a, on a kind of funny note. One of the things that Tutankhamun changed is museums. For the rest of history, museums are different because of Tutankhamun. His exhibition in 1970s, when the Egyptian government let a a major Tutankhamun exhibit travel the world, this changed museum economy. Before, there was never a blockbuster exhibit. Tut is the first blockbuster exhibit. And people realized, museum directors realized, that you could get a blockbuster exhibit and make a fortune for your museum by selling tchotchkes in the gift shop. I mean, you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art sold $1,500 replicas of a Selkett statue that were made out of plastic. So museum directors realized we can have blockbuster exhibits. So that's why you can get a Michelangelo, a Leonardo exhibit. It's all realized that now people will come and look at things and pay well for it. That's why, you know, and I said I'd end on a funny note, Steve Martin, the famous Saturday Night Live skit where he sings the song King Tut, born in Babylonia, built a condo, made a stone of King Tut. Well, that's really about museums because if you remember the line if i'd have known people would line up to see him i'd have taken all my money and bought me a museum steve martin's a smart guy he knew that tut's legacy is museums are going to make a fortune on exhibits yeah that's that's good stuff (laughs) yeah absolutely and so As we celebrate this person, this pharaoh, this legacy, and of course your book, Dr. Breyer, where can people get the book and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, some of your other projects that you might have going on in future research? Yeah, well, I'm still I'm still a mummy guy. You know, I'm still always interested in working with mummies and things like that. So I'm still looking to find out more things about Tut. If I get my hands on some of those samples that I want, the internal organs, maybe even get a closer up look at, at Tutankhamun, certain things that I want to do. So that's my future projects, things like that. 
The, the book is available on, on Amazon. Um, all you have to do is go into my name, Briar, B-R-I-E-R, or like you said, the, the, the title is Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World. I think right now, or at least it has been for a long time, it's the number one archaeology book and the number one um, ancient history book on, on Amazon. So I, th- I think it, it's not really a credit to me. It's King Tut. Yep. He's still still making money for everybody out there. So that's great. Hey, uh, listen, I encourage everyone to go pick up the book. I have a copy. It is truly fantastic. Uh, let's keep it at number one. It's something that anybody who's interested in history and Egyptology should certainly have in their collection. So make sure you go out and pick up Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World. Dr. Breyer, thank you so much for joining us here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's been a pleasure. Go to Egypt. It was a real honor to speak with Dr. Breyer. It's not every day that you get to sit down and talk with someone who's been involved with the field of Egyptology for as long as he has been. Mr. Mummy, they call him, and for a very good reason. Uh, it was fascinating. His book is very well put together. I encourage everyone to get out there and check it out. It's doing very well on the uh, publishers' lists right now, and it's called Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World. And again, it explores so much of what we discussed here tonight in the interview, but it also gets into a lot of the details. And it's the only book that I've seen because I have quite a big Egyptology library, but it's the only one in that library that takes it from the beginning of you know, the politics and everything that were happening around the Valley of the Kings all the way through the discovery to modern day where they are implementing all the wonderful things that we talked about, CT scans, MRIs, all the things that are available today. So I encourage everyone to check that out. And again, it was a true honor to have Dr. Breyer here on the program and uh, very much looking forward to doing more shows on Egyptology in the future for sure. Yes, please. I second that. And since James isn't here, I'll third that for you too, because man, I love the subject. It would be so great. I've got a whole list of Egyptologists I'd love to have on the program. And in fact, I've thought about reaching out to a few of them, but man, there's so much to cover with that subject. So much ground to cover. Think about some of the mysterious things about, for instance, the historical records that we have. Herodotus went there and he spoke to the priests. He talks about the pyramids. Where was the Sphinx? Right. Why was it not mentioned? It wasn't even mentioned. You know, I'd, I'd love to talk to historians and scholars who understand that dynamic between the Greeks and the Egyptians and the cultural exchanges that were occurring at that time. And when characters like, again, this, it's not really that controversial, but Solon, who's mentioned in those fragmentary documents by Plato, who was not a historian, he was a philosopher and they were dialogues. But he nonetheless mentions the historical Solon, which gave rise to some of the Atlantis mythology. You know, I'd love to talk to an expert about some of those dynamics, those cultural dynamics between the Greeks and the Egyptians. And when the Greeks like Solon or like Herodotus, for that matter, when they would go there and they would speak to the Egyptians and we have those earliest recorded historical accounts, you know, that in itself is an area so worthy of study. I mean, there's so many directions we could go, and I do hope that we'll do that some more. And ultimately, above all else, you know where this is going, Jason. I hope we get our crew over there to the pyramids, and we actually make the trip, take the dive, and go over there. And, you know, we've also talked about visiting some of the other similar, you know, structures, those marvels, those pyramidal wonders down in Mesoamerica as well. You've been down there. I've been down there. But we haven't taken the Seven Ages team, and we've been talking for a long time about maybe trying to plan a trip and bringing some of you folks along with us. In fact, if that would interest you, traveling with Seven Ages and going to some of those sites in Mexico and places like that, visiting some of these rich archaeological sites, and maybe having some experts tag along and join us, if we could work that out. If that interests you, send an email our way, jason or micah at sevenages.org. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think. We're always trying to think of fun things and great ways that we can continue to bring the best in history and archaeology to our listenership. And so with that, my friend, we raise a glass to our missing brother, James Waldo, who I'm sure is at home with his lovely lady. For some reason, not podcasting tonight. I don't know why he's not here, but it's okay. You and I are here. We remain the proud, the few. (laughs) And a great job on that interview. I raise my glass to you, sir. 
Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, James is lost in time and space, but he should be back for the next episode. So just hang in there, everyone. Well, indeed, thanks to all you guys for hanging out with us. And of course, for making this show possible, you, the dear listeners of this program, make it possible and mean the world to us. So on behalf of James Waldo, Jason Pentrail, I am Micah Hanks. We are the Seven Ages Research Associates. And as always, we'll catch you next time here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Audio Journal.